we'll move on to what's going to be an essential thing. The national, um, the N national school and resource agreement is under discussion at the moment. A government committee due to report, I think, well, if not um, uh, very soon indeed. Um, and that's going to have a massive impact, of course, with, with the current situation in Western Australia in particular, where 75% of the funding comes from the state government, 20 from the federal government, so you only get 95% of the schooling resource standard. And in making that even worse is that there's a 4% that used to be paid in addition from the state government that's been rolled in um, to that 75%. So in effect, uh, WA schools are down at 91%, something no doubt you heard a lot about. So what, what are the situations around recurrent and capital funding and what needs to be done there? Well, we're saying that the um, uh, state government should use the opportunity uh, presented by the new um, National Schools Resource Agreement to increase funding. I mean, one of the things that we found was that real income per, per student had declined over the period that we were examining since 2010, um, and that funding to public schools in Western Australia had been cut in real terms, so we've seen a steady decline, and measured against the schooling resource standard, which is the kind of recommended uh, minimum, not maximum, um, as you say, Western Australia was falling short. And this is in the context of private schools being overfunded. Government schools are underfunded, private schools are overfunded, government schools cater for everybody, including the most disadvantaged students, and the resources simply aren't available to educate many of these students with special needs and behavioural problems, and that's something that we touched on in some detail in the report as well. So there's a real inequity in funding, but there's a, a particular need to increase the funding in Western Australia, and we've indicated some areas where those funds could go. We're not just saying increase for the sake of it. We're, mm. we're saying increase to improve student support, increase to reduce class sizes, increase to improve curriculum development. These are all areas that will make a difference to students' experience of school and their ability to benefit from their education. And, and Colin, the issue that that ties into, as we said, is the number of pupils who need extra assistance. Um, there are class size issues in Western Australia. We have the largest class sizes across most bands in the country and the student to teacher ratios are, are not great. Um, Jason Clare is talking, the Federal Education Minister has talked frequently about tying um, any increase in funding to specific outcomes such as, for example, small group tutoring. Um, again, those are areas that you've looked at and what do you see as the potential solutions mm. there? Well, certainly um, it was raised by a number of people about uh, the number of children they have in their class, um, particularly those who have uh, difficulties, um, whether they bring them in from home or whether they have them as personally. And teachers are saying that they need far more support. And one way you could do that is actually look at um, uh, reducing class sizes or funding those children and or funding those children in a much better way than they currently are. And I think Carmen's already mentioned that the lack of funding compared to other states hasn't allowed this this um, state to actually keep pace with that. And so we need to look at how we support children with disadvantage uh, in a very different way, in a real way. And what teachers are asking is, is uh, we're happy to see where the funding is, but we actually want it to be very, very transparent in how it's delivered, uh, both at a national level, a state level, but more importantly, in the classroom? How, how's that funding actually making a difference? And if that translates to smaller class sizes, if it translates to some better support for group work, then that's what should happen. And we've been very strong on that in the recommendations. And of course, one of the, the contradictions of that, I suppose, is that we're already suffering massive teacher shortages. So you'll get people saying, well, if you, in, you make the classes smaller, you'll exacerbate those teacher shortages. But if you don't make the classes smaller and reduce the workload, the teachers are going to leave anyway. They're burning out. I mean, we, we're finding in schools that, you know, have a lot of students with various disadvantages, educational, social, emotional, behavioural, that they're, they're struggling to cope in this situation. And I think it's pretty clear that a lot of those are the younger teachers, the ones who are just entering the profession, go to regional remote schools, for example, and they're expected to do the impossible. So what we're arguing is that they're the ones that need the additional resources. The, the funding formula within Western Australia needs to be changed to reflect those greater demands of certain types of schools and certain areas and certain student groups. Um, it, it's pretty clear, I think, although we don't have all the data, it's pretty clear that the money is not um, going where it's 
that's most needed. So class size matters a great deal in the early years, particularly for disadvantaged students and for students who are falling behind. It doesn't matter quite so much for some of the you know, better resourced schools and, and better supported students. But in every case, it's, it's better for the teachers because their morale is improved and their capacity to, to deliver and do that extra work that's needed in curriculum is also improved. So these things are all related. And we found that some teachers are having um, more than half the students in their class on individual education plans, which require them to deliver specific tailored responses to students with difficulties of various kinds. Simply impossible. It mm. just can't be done. And, and of course, not all children are equal. With, with the great stress, not their fault, but no. a child might need, with, with ADD, for example, may need much more time from a teacher yet they're accounted as one child, in effect, yes. in the class. And in effect, the number is, the, the, the need is mu- it's not like that. It's like having two or three extra children. And that's what class. we've recommended, that when you have students who are on those plans, that they should count as two or three mm. in, in working out class sizes. And, of course, worth reflecting, we, we don't get too complicated with our percentages around funding because we all go goggle-eyed, but originally WA was allocated 105% of the school and resource standard, the yes. extra 5% reflecting those needs in particularly regional and rural areas that, that were different as they are in the Northern Territory. So it's got even worse in that sense, um, right. even though we only talk about 100% now. For teachers, for pupils, um, the other issue we, we will perhaps not mention in too much detail, but developmental readiness for school. We want to send the kids younger and younger, which again brings more and more issues with it. Um, this must have a, a tremendous Im- uh, impact on the mental health and well-being, not only of the teachers, but of course of the students. That's right. I mean, it's 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 fairly difficult to say how much has changed over time. You know, trends are difficult to, to monitor. But people are certainly much more aware of mental health and behavioural problems in schools. Uh, and, and many would argue that they've, the problems have actually got worse as well. Certainly the pressure is on teachers and principals to respond to those extra special needs, and yet the resources haven't flowed uh, in commensurate with those problems. And the developmental readiness of school, I think that's that's a real phenomenon that um, has been pretty well documented. But putting more young children into classroom-like environment is probably not the solution, mm. which is why we've recommended that uh, universal access to affordable, quality, early learning opportunities, you know, in a very broad sense, needs to be part of state and federal government initiatives. But also making sure that we take that takes place in an environment where play and exploration and curiosity are forefront rather than, you know, simply pushing schooling back to younger and younger groups. So that sort of plays learning focus. Yeah. Uh, and Colin, in your previous role, obviously yeah. you, you have a, a, a big interest in this, this feeling that antisocial aggressive behaviour is getting worse. Obviously we see the, the phone videos and, and the department and the minister have, to their credit, uh, and the previous minister tried to, to tackle these issues. But we see the fights between students. We, we see constant, I think our recent survey suggested at least one serious incident per term at 90-odd percent of schools um, in terms of violence towards teachers, either from students or even worse, in my opinion, from their parents. So ha- how, does, how is that all sort of bubbling together with these other issues that underlie these things? Certainly over the last five or six years when I was uh, Commissioner for Children and Young People, we conducted several health and wellbeing surveys of young people themselves about how they felt uh, to their school, their community and so forth. And they raised mental health as an issue for themselves. Um, and one of the things that they were really, really clear about is that many of the solutions we, we try and implement, whether it be in schools or community, often were in isolation from them. They, they didn't include children and young people in terms of the solution. And so it's a little bit like um, many of the policies we impose on groups rather than think about how do we incorporate their thinking into solutions. Now, they won't have all the answers, um, but we need to actually stop and, and reflect if there is this, what we think is a fairly significant change in our community, how do we actually understand it better before we lay on on a range of policies? And then you have the poor teachers who have to try and interpret that in isolation. And so we need to actually work with teachers as well to see what they're uh, facing each day. And that's why this, this report is so important because we did hear from a number of teachers about how they're feeling towards children with aggression, how they're feeling about mental health, not only children's mental health, but their own. 
um, and how it's being ignored in terms of policy. And so we need to pause a little bit here, get some really good research around what makes a difference, and then ensure that everyone's voice is tailored into the solution rather than uh, just impose a solution, which I think, uh, while in good faith, many government officials have tried to do that, uh, it's been an isolation of the real solution finders. And I, I know in, in part that that was addressed, a couple of the submissions I think mentioned the idea of some sort of hubs in certain communities where, where you have the services you need on site, that you're not dealing separately, that the time that teachers and particularly principals have to take um, to get children the care and, and attention and, and medical treatment in effect that they need is taking up so much time. So, so what are the listening, obviously, to, to both students and teachers, very important. Are those sorts of hubs a, a potential solution as well? Well, the idea that the, the support services should be closer to the school, mm. I think, is what came through it time and time again, that um, the support services had become remote, difficult to access, often unresponsive, no criticism of the people actually providing them, it's just the way the structure has evolved. And that means that teachers often feel abandoned when they have those really difficult cases to deal with. And they have to wing it. You know, they have to play it by ear. They haven't always been particularly well trained in the programs that are said to deal with these problems like aggression um, among students. Um, and that was another thing that came through time and time again, the need for appropriate professional development with time out of the classroom and reinforced. You know, you don't do it once. You have to do it you know, time and time again, because each new generation of, of teachers needs to go through it. If you're going to create a whole school environment um, that's, that is, um, if you like, responding to the possibility of aggression, preventing it in particular, then people need to have that as part of the school culture. And that's difficult when it's on off and you get little things that are kind of bolted on to the mm. system rather than becoming uh, intrinsic to it. Yeah. And Colin, bolted on is a really good phrase because all of these things that we've discussed start chipping into to the effect on workload, on sat job satisfaction of teachers, the performance and, and the turnover of teachers, the number of hours they work. And a lot of them do seem to be, here's a solution to this problem, but because of the way it's implemented, it creates another layer of bureaucracy and, and, and of course, makes things worse. So, so is that something that came up in, in your findings? Oh, that was very loudly echoed by almost all, all people who contributed. Um, what, what they're finding is that there are many of these programs that they feel um, that are being imposed, they feel haven't been researched deeply enough. Um, they're really concerned that um, they, they are are placed in there to try and address a small issue, but in doing that, exactly as you've said, they create a range of others. And without the, the real hard evidence of what will make a difference, uh, including deep research and including listening to the voice of all those involved, um, it's almost impossible to get uh, a process that can be embedded that will make a difference. And I think time and time again we saw and heard from people that um, these constant programs come and go, they're forever trying to catch up with how they implement them. By the time they get to implement them, they've changed. And so we need to actually find a consistent approach on how we can support teachers to be better teachers, to understand the world that they're, they're teaching in, um, particularly in their classroom, and the changes that, that young people are now facing. And if we can do that, I think we're on a, on a pathway to have, maybe find a few solutions. But equal to that, as Carmen has said, um, we heard so many people tell us that having local support is the key to any success. So we, as a system, if we're not listening to that, then we're actually um, creating yet another problem. And it's interesting, Carmen, that the, 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 if we did a, a good old early 2000s word map, yes. remember those, I suspect consultation would come up and, and be a very big uh, word in that word map. And, and that seems to be the key consultation with teachers about what teachers need. That's right. I mean, when it comes to changes to policy um, that have an impact on workload, the first question to ask, um, or the first people to ask about that are the, those at the, the coalface, the teachers in the classroom. What effect is this going to have on their workload? What effect is it going to have on their capacity to deliver for their students? These these should be fundamental. No, no policy should be introduced without, as I say, a clear objective in improving student outcomes, but also a clear understanding of the impact that it has on teachers in the classroom. The, the workload, the after-school demands that are placed on them, all of those things that we heard about, including, you know, the, the imposition sometimes of solutions that are not 
um, conducive to good learning. The commercialization of the curriculum, as an example, you know, in some schools what's happened is they can't get access, they haven't been able to get access to good quality curriculum materials. They're bought off the shelf, which costs a lot of money. There's money being wasted in this space. And then teachers are asked to implement something that they may find pedagogically um, <laughs> stupid, no. to, not to put too fine a point no. on it. And that therefore adds to the stress. You know, they're having to learn this new material, they're having to implement it in the classroom, it's the school's uh, material, and when they move, there's another whole set of problems that they've got to confront. 